So uh, we have been uh, in a teaching series, right, called The Kingdom Secrets. We're talking about the secrets to the kingdom of God. The kingdom of God is all about God's reign and rule. God wants to reign and rule not only on your hearts, but also on the earth, okay? And so we know that in Matthew chapter 13, in your New Testament, it's the only chapter in your entire Bible that is dedicated to talking about these kingdom secrets. He gives seven different parables talking about four different secrets to the kingdom of God. Now, we know that they are secrets because right there in Matthew chapter 13, in verse 10 through 11, it says this, the disciples came and asked him, why do you speak to this in parables? He replied, because the knowledge of the secrets, everybody say secrets, the secrets of the kingdom of heaven. And then he says it again in Matthew 13, 35, if we get the scripture up. It says, I will open my mouth in parables. I will utter things kept in secret from the foundation of the world. And so Matthew 13, he gives us seven different parables. Parable is just a story illustrating spiritual truths that, have reveal, that are revealing secrets to God's kingdom. And so Matthew 13, on the screen here, he gives seven different parables, and he gives us four different themes with four different secrets. If we can go to the next slide, please. Uh, number one, uh, it talks about the parable of the sower. And so that was all about the receptivity of God's word and that in order to understand all of the secrets, you have to at least understand this number one secret. For if you don't understand the parable of the sower, you're not going to understand any of the kingdom secrets that I'm going to have to offer. And so the first kingdom secret is there are four hearts. And number one, you got to get your heart right. You got to do everything you can on this earth to get your heart right to spend eternity forever with God. You got to get your heart right. I'm, some of you, I'm giving you 50 years. Some of you, I'm giving you 80 years. Some of you guys, I'm giving 92 years and plus or minus. You got to get your heart right. Number two, uh, we talked about the parable of the mustard seed and the parable of 11. These two are lumped together because it's all about growth of God's kingdom. And so this is the secret number two is you got to stay focused on kingdom growth in your life. You got to stay focused on my working in your life, says the Lord. You got to be really focused on this. And so we talked about how to develop a growth, a kingdom growth mentality. We talked about steps on how to develop a kingdom growth mentality. If you miss the messages, make sure you download them and listen to them. Then we talked about the parable of the treasure and the parable of the pearl last week. And that's all about the value of God's kingdom. And the secret there is you got to upgrade your number one core value to be God, the one who created you, the one who formed you in your mother's womb. we got to lean upon him and upgrade our core values. The core is the soul. If it's the soul, it's the inner workings of who you are and how God wired you emotionally, mentally. And so we got to get our core values in right pecking order with God being our number one value. And so that was a setup. Last week was a very feel-good message. Amen? Amen? If you were here last week and were ministered, can you just give the Lord praise? No, I, that doesn't sound like you mean it. There you go. We talked about God has made you his number one value. We talked about you being the treasure that God's seeking out. We talked about you being the great pearl of great price that God had to purchase to ransom your soul back. And so we make God our number one core value. That's leading up today's message, and I talked to you guys about this. I've actually gave lots of caution and warning, saying come this week and have your, your uh, seat belts ready because we're going fast, and uh, we're going to talk about a difficult subject. It's the parable of the wheat and tares, the parable of the dragnet, which is all about the judgment of God's kingdom. And in the judgment of God's kingdom, he reveals secret number four. Again, you want to get a hold of these four secrets in your life. Get your heart right. Get a growth mentality going in your life. Uh, know the value of upgrading your core value to God. Why? Because God is so focused on these last two parables, which reveals the fourth secret, which is this. It's all about keeping God's judgment, the final judgment, at the forefront of your mind. God is interested in you keeping his final judgment not in the back of your mind, the forefront of your mind. And so when we talk about the judgment of God, 
we're ultimately talking about God punishing sin. God is a holy God, and yet we need to see his judgment in the beauty of two aspects of what he offers. Number one, he offers us the opportunity to have a free will. If God did not allow us free will, which gives us the ability to love him and gives us the ability to do his will, or the ability not to love him and the ability to do evil, then we would be AI robots and we wouldn't, be, we wouldn't have a choice and we would be programmed to automatically love God. But God is so gracious that he gives you a free will. And in that free will, like I said, you can either love him and choose to obey and choose to do his will, or you can choose to deny him and choose to do your own will. And then number two, he's also a God of justice. If God did not punish evil, if he did not punish sin, if he did not punish wickedness, he would not be a just God. And God is saying in these two parables that there's a day of reckoning coming where everybody on planet Earth will have to give an account before God when they stand before him. Now the problem is, we all know that we have sin. And a lot of us cry out for God's justice on the earth, but for some reason we never cry out for God's justice on us. And so if God were to answer your prayer and, you, and he releases justice on the earth today at 12 o'clock, I don't know if anybody in here would be still alive at 12.01. Because it's all encompassing. The Bible says all of us have sin. Now, some people would say something like this, well, Billy, if God's a loving God, why would he send anybody to hell? In which I would respond, well, if God is a just God, why would he send anyone to heaven? If heaven's perfect, and, and we all believe heaven's perfect, but if he allows you as a sinner into heaven, or me as a sinner into heaven, well, then that means heaven's not perfect anymore, is it? It's just as corrupt as on earth. Man corrupted it on earth. God's the one who beautifies everything. And so a lot of people would say, well, Billy, if God's a God of, of love, he wouldn't send anyone to hell. No, 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 no. But if God's a God of justice, he wouldn't send anyone to heaven. Nobody. Not one. And so some people take the baby and they throw it out with the bath water and they really emphasize and they create an idol out of God's love. They emphasize God's love, God's love, God's love. And God is a God of love but he's also a God of righteousness and he's a God that's holy and he's a God of light and he's a God of mercy and he's a God of righteousness. Listen, you can't have one aspect of God and neglect all the other components that make God's nature up. God is completely love, but he doesn't sacrifice his love at the opportunity of expressing who he is in his, in his justice. And so God is love, God is just, God is mercy, and all of those components of God have to be expressed, thankfully, out of free will, those who want to be rescued from their sin can be rescued from their sin. God rescues people from their sin by taking the punishment of all evil on his shoulders. In other words, he's a substitute for you. And so God says, all right, because I love you and I still need to satisfy my justice, I'm going to take all the punishment that you deserve and I'm going to pour it on myself. I'm going to completely pour it out on myself. And so you, out of your free will, if you choose to be rescued... You can choose to follow Jesus who took your punishment in your place. But for those who don't want to be rescued, you don't have to be rescued. You do, out of your free will, you do not have to be rescued. You can choose to take on your own punishment for your guilt. You can choose to take on your own punishment for your wickedness, your own punishment for your sin. And that's what the final judgment's going to be all about because justice it will be served. So God gives us the ability to do what we want to do. We can either choose to want to be rescued, in which Jesus takes the punishment, or we can choose to say, whatever, God, I'm going to take on my own punishment, and I'm going to take the risk and, 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 and live my life according to my will. And so in the afterlife, there's only two experiences. You're only going to have two experiences in the afterlife. The first experience are those who experience his justice for a lifetime of sin, or it's going to be those who experience mercy and grace 
as Jesus took all the punishment to demonstrate both his love and his justice. But the choice is yours. So when we're talking about God's judgment, you gotta appreciate that he gives you the free will. And you gotta appreciate that judgment is always in light of justice being served. Apologist Frank Turek says this, God is too loving to let people into heaven against their will. He is too loving to let people into heaven against their will. He says the assumption is that everyone on earth wants to go to heaven, but that's not true. Not everybody on earth wants to go to heaven because Jesus is in heaven. And that's what makes heaven heaven. It's the presence of Jesus, the presence of life. And there are way too many people who really don't want anything to do with Jesus. So it would be very unloving if a person over and over and over and over again rejects Jesus, and then at the end, God forces them to be with him forever and to love him forever. That would be really unloving for God to do. If people don't want to love God, he and love will simply pull away. Frank goes into say, he gives an illustration, and I like it. He says, imagine some of you single ladies who are out there, and a guy's absolutely in love with you. I mean, he's sending you flowers. He's sending you gift cards. You, he, he's just, he's sending you notes. Hey, let's connect. Let's be with one another. I would love to take you out for coffee. Let's, let's connect. And over and over again, you're like, nah, I don't want, nah, I don't want anything to do with you. I don't want anything to do with you. Okay, but if he kept saying, hey, let's keep going out, let's keep going out, and he kept pursuing and kept pursuing, and you kept going, no, 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 you know what, you're actually kind of weird, you're actually giving me the creeps, and you know what, in fact, I'm gonna put a restraining order against you, I don't want anything to do with you, stop following me, stop sending me the love cards, start sending me the gift cards, stop sending me the flowers over, stop it, enough, enough, I don't want anything to do with you. It would be very unloving for that guy. What would be the proper response if that guy really loved the girl? Would he not just go like this? Would he not back away? Or would the loving thing to do go, would the loving thing to do be this? I'm gonna override your will and I'm gonna force you to love me. So why do we put that on God? In the end of our life, people who reject him over and over and over and over again, he's not going to override people's will and say, now you can, I'm gonna force you to love me and be with me for all eternity long. You would say that's not loving. So the proper thing for God to do is to completely let go. C.S. Lewis put it this way. There are two kinds of people in this world. Those who bend their knee to God and say to him, your will be done. Or those who out of their free will refuse to bend their knee to God and God says ultimately, okay, your will be done. Jesus in his ministry warned people over and over and over again about this final judgment of sin on his ministry. And he does it here again in Matthew 13, verse 24. If you have your Bibles, go ahead and turn there. Matthew 13, verse 24 Jesus told them another parable. It's the kingdom of heaven, and it's too long to put up on the screen, so I'm just gonna read it to you. The kingdom of heaven is like a man who, ser or sorry, who sowed good seed in his field. But while everyone was sleeping, his enemy came and sowed weeds among the wheat and went away. When the wheat sprouted and formed heads, then the weeds also appeared. The owner of the servants came to him and said, "'Sir, didn't you sow good seed in your field?' Where then did all the weeds come from? An enemy did this, he replied. The servants asked him, do you want us to go and pull up the weeds? No, he answered, because while you are pulling up the weeds, you may root up the wheat with them. Let both of them grow together until the harvest. At that time, I will tell the harvesters, first collect the weeds and tie them up in bundles to be burned. Then gather the wheat and bring this into the barn. Now, this parable actually disturbed the disciples. They were bothered by this. They weren't bothered so much by the other ones. They were really, I mean, they were bothered a little bit in trying to understand the parable of the sower, but this one, they were really wanting to understand. And they're not wanting to understand the wheat part. They're wanting to understand the weeds. And so look at with me, 
In verse 36, it says, his disciples came to him and said, explain to us the parable of the weeds. We get the wheat, the wheat is good. But what is this thing about the weeds being collected at the end of the age or at, at the harvesters and being burned in the fire? What is that all about? They want to know what that's all about. So Jesus said to them, I will interpret it for you. Aren't you guys thankful Jesus is a good teacher? He gives you all the answers ahead of time. He says, the one who sowed the good seed is the son of man. The whole field is the world. And the good seed stands for the sons of the kingdom. The weeds are the sons of the evil one. And the enemy who sows them is the devil. The harvest is the end of the age. And the harvesters are my angels. And as the weeds are pulled up and burned in the fire, so it will be at the end of the age. The Son of Man will come and he will send out his angels and they will weed out of his kingdom everything that causes sin and all who do evil. They will throw them into a fiery furnace where there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. Then the righteous will shine like the sun in the kingdom of their father. He who has ears, let them hear. Now many people who would say, Jesus is a good teacher. Oh, he's a phenomenal. You got a lot of people who believe Jesus is a good teacher. And then you ask them about the teaching of this, they go, whoa, 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 because they're alarmed as well. And so Jesus interprets this parable. To me, it sounds pretty clear. It's almost like I don't even have to teach it because Jesus already told us what it meant. But in case you missed it, in case you aren't familiar with agricultural farming, in case you're not familiar with wheat and weeds and how they're bundled up together, and, or sorry, how they grow up together and how they need to be separated, he gives another parable explaining the exact same kingdom truth but using a fishing analogy. And so, Matthew 13 again. He really wants to make sure his disciples understand that. So now, verse 47, he gives a completely different parable. Once again... The kingdom of heaven is like a net that was thrown down into the lake and it caught all kinds of fish. When it was full, when the net was full, the fishermen pulled it up to the shore and they sat down and they collected the good fish in baskets and they threw away the bad fish. This is how it's gonna be at the end of the age. The angels will come and they're gonna separate the wicked from the righteous and throw them into the fiery furnace where there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. Have you not understood these things, Jesus asked. And they said, yes. We understand. Now, in case you missed it again, Jesus is so adamant about us understanding this kingdom secret. He gives us another parable explaining the exact same thing at the very end of his life, before he's about ready to go to the cross and experience the punishment of all the sin of the world on his shoulders, he really wants you to understand, as a follower of Christ, keeping his judgment at the forefront of your mind. So he gives another parable in Matthew 25. It's the parable of the sheep and the goats. It says this in verse 31, when the Son of Man comes in his glory, and all the angels with him. In other words, Jesus is not going to be playing around when he comes back. All the angels will be coming with him. He will then sit on his glorious throne, and all the nations will be gathered before him. He will separate the people from another as a shepherd separates the sheep from the goats. He will put the sheep on his right and the goats on his left. And the king will say to those on his right, because again, you can't have a kingdom without a king, and Jesus will be king, Jesus is king. The king will say to those on his right, the sheep, come you who are blessed by my father, take your inheritance, the kingdom prepared for you since the creation of the world. But then he will say to those on his left, depart from me, you who are cursed into the eternal fire prepared for the devil and his angels. Then they will go away, they will all go away to eternal punishment. Notice the word punishment. But the righteous to eternal life. And so, 
I don't only give you two parables of this, we give you three parables of this. It all has the same secret, which is keeping the final judgment of God at the forefront of our mind, not in the back of our mind, on the forefront of our mind. In these parables, in parable number one, we first see the wheat, the wheat which represents the righteous, and then we see the weeds which represent the wicked. He then goes on to the fishing analogy. We see the good fish represent the righteous, the bad fish represent the wicked. Then he goes on to the sheep and the goats. The sheep represent the righteous, and the goats represent those who are wicked in the world. So we have these two categories. You have the righteous, and you have the wicked. Let's talk about the righteous first. The righteous are those who out of their free will respond to the call of God to come home to him. And out of their free will, they choose to believe that Jesus, as a substitute for their sin, took on their punishment at full at Calvary on the cross. Jesus took all the punishment of your sin on his shoulders. And when you believe in him, you automatically are converted from the inside out, and you categorically become the righteousness of God. God declares you righteous in his sight. Your relationship with God is restored and you are made right with God in accordance to Jesus taking your punishment for you in the past. That's what it means to become righteous, the righteousness of God. But the wicked, that's a different category. The wicked are those who refuse to turn to Jesus and have their sins forgiven and become the righteousness of God. They refuse to do it. Now, these wicked people, they could be obvious sinners. You know, the obvious hardcore sinners. The obvious sinners. Uh, they're the people who, I don't know, for some of us in here, they're the people who maybe smoke, chew, or hang out with people who do. You know, whatever. Maybe it's the hardcore wicked people. It's like the murderers. It's the, it's the adulterers. It's the the raging alcoholics, it's the violent crime people, it's the people who are just awful murderers, it's the terrorists of the world, it's the bad, it's the really bad people. Now, some of you guys who are Republicans and Democrats, you might be just pointing at each other in the political party. That's how it's become. Is that not how it's become? One party says you're wicked, the other party says you're completely wicked. What I'm saying is this, the wicked people it definitely refers to those who refuse to accept Jesus' punishment for their sin and become the righteousness of God. They could be the hardcore, the mean, the, the raging sinners. They can also be the subtle sinners. The subtle sinners. People who are generally good. People who may even have biblical morals. They may even say, no, I agree with the Bible. I'm a cultural Christian. And I, I kind of believe in that. I believe in that, but I'm not really accounting for my former sins being put on Jesus. I can't say he's the only way. I mean, there's got to be multitudes of ways, just like there's multitudes of flights going to India. There's got to be multitudes of flight going into heaven. I can't say he's the only way, but I, I agree in some of the principles, and I'm generally a good person. I'm very accepting. I'll accept Jesus just as much as I'll accept Buddha and, and all the other gods that are out there. Okay, so there can be subtle wickedness. It still doesn't give an account for the sins that they did previously. Uh, the wicked can also refer to, and this is a big one, the wicked also refers to not only the hardcore sinners, not only subtle sinners, it refers to false believers. False believers. False believers don't really have a personal relationship with God. And they don't bear the fruit that God requires in his kingdom. In fact, they continue to practice evil maybe even while doing ministry. They could be your worship pastors, singing on a Sunday morning, worshiping God, but really it's practicing evil and they don't have a relationship with God. It looks like they're expressing their talents to God, but they really don't know God. It could be, it could be the women's pastor, it could be the senior pastor, it could be the kids department, it could be kids workers, it could be people on the choir, the ushers, the hospitality team. It could be false believers, even in ministry, putting on a forefront that they're followers of Jesus, and they might be following him to an extent, but they don't know him. They don't know him. They don't know him at a relational level. 
John 17, 3, put this on the screen, it says this. Now this is eternal life, Jesus says, that they would know you, the only true God in Jesus Christ whom you've sent, that they would know you. And then Matthew 7, 22, he says it again. Many of you guys have heard this. It says this, many, which I'm referring to false believers, many will say to me on that day, what day? He's talking about the judgment again. Lord, Lord, that means master, master. Hey, master. Hi, master. You were truly my master on earth. Really? Did we not prophesy in your name? And in your name drive out demons. Okay, so they have the gifts of the Spirit. They're able to prophesy. And they, they're able to exercise their kingdom authority in driving out evil. These are people who were in ministry. And in your name drive out demons. And in your name perform many miracles, which is another sign of the gift of the Holy Spirit. Then I will tell them plainly, what does it say? I never knew you. Away from me, you who practice evil. Lifestyle of evilness. Come to church, it's good. You might get some good principles, you get some good teachings. But do you know him? Do you know him? At a heart level, do you know him? You might be struggling with sin. That's okay. We all struggle with sin. But are you pursuing him in the struggle or are you denying him in the struggle? God wants you to know him even in the suffering of overcoming our own sin on this earth. And so it's very clear that each of these parables deal with the final judgment that will take place for one of these two groups. Again, there's only two groups. It's the righteous and the wicked. There's only two groups. There's not three groups. There's not five groups. There's not 20 groups. There's not 150 groups. There's not 5,000 groups. The groups don't continue to grow. You're either righteous or you're wicked, as simple as you being a boy or a girl. You're either righteous or you're wicked. And so the category of the righteous comes by turning from your sin and believing in Jesus who took the punishment for your sin. Or you're in the category of the wicked for those that have free will, refuse to be rescued, and decide to deny Christ and continue to love their sin more. And so from this final judgment, we learn a minimum of six things. Six things. Six things on why to keep this judgment at the forefront of our minds. If you're taking notes, number one, we learn that the final judgment is a sure thing as it will be very, very real. It will be very real. It's so real that he wants to make sure his disciples understand the severity of this judgment. He says in verse 43, whoever has ears, let them hear this message. And then he says it again in verse 51, do you understand what I'm saying to you? It's very real. Jesus would say, I speak metaphorically right now, giving these parables, but the day will come where this judgment will be very real. It's not by accident that I made you. And then number two, we learn that this final judgment is in the future. Notice verse 40. On the screen, it says, As the weeds are pulled up and burned in the fire, so it will be at the end of the age. That's future tense. This is how it will be at the end of the age. So although God's final judgment is future tense for the wicked category, it's past tense for the righteous category. Does that make sense? It's future tense in that the wicked are going to have to suffer and be punished for their sin in the future. There's a day of reckoning coming. But it's past tense for the righteous who believe in Jesus because Jesus died on the cross for your sin 2,000 years ago. The justice has been served. But he gives you the free will to choose. Number three, we learn that this judgment will involve angels separating the wicked from the righteous. Notice with me on verse 49 on the screen. Verse 49 on the screen. Okay, I'll just read it to you. It says this. The angels will come and will separate the wicked from the righteous. So the angels are going to come, and who's separating the wicked from the righteous? Is it Jesus or is it the angels? The angels who serve God are going to come and they're going to separate the righteous, or sorry, the wicked away from the righteous. This is because this type of judgment is not for the righteous. 
This type of judgment is not for the righteous. Again, their judgment was past tense. It does not mean that believers won't give an account before God. You'll give an account before God, but you're not going to suffer the final judgment, which is for the punishment of evil, because again, that punishment was already established at Calvary when Jesus died on the cross. You'll still have to give an account before God, but it's not going to be you know, eternal punishment. It's going to be more of eternal rewards for what you did right on this earth while still giving an account. Okay, But it's clear that this judgment is for the wicked. Number four, we learn that the final judgment reveals that the kingdom is inclusive and that everybody will be gathered into it. But it's also exclusive that only the righteous can obtain it and enjoy it. Only the righteous can obtain the kingdom and enjoy the kingdom. According to the parable of the sheep, Matthew 25, on the screen, verse 34 through 46, says this. The king will say to those on his right, come. And let me tell you, when he says to you on judgment day, and you're in the category of the righteous, and he says, come here. I guarantee you, you're going to have a huge smile way up here. And Jesus is not looking at you saying, come here, you're in trouble. No, he's saying, come here, it's done. I'm separating the wickedness from the righteousness. There's not going to be any more evil. You don't have to worry about all the pain, the suffering anymore. Come to me. So he says, come you who are blessed. So you're in the category of the righteous. You're blessed by my Father. Take your inheritance. So there's an inheritance waiting for you in heaven. The righteous will enjoy the kingdom that has been custom designed and prepared for you since the creation of the world. And there you are going to enjoy eternal life forevermore in the camp of righteousness, serving a righteousness, a righteous God in whom the government will be placed on his shoulder. It will be a government of kingdom principles, a government of love, joy, and peace will reign in his kingdom forevermore. And you as a righteous, you get to enjoy it and you get to experience the blessings of it because it's de designed for you specifically. According to the parable of the wheat and the weeds, the righteous will also enjoy the purity of the kingdom. Look at this next verse. The purity of the kingdom. The Son of Man will send out his angels, will weed out of his kingdom everything that causes sin, and who will do evil. It will be a sin-free environment because all evil will be completely weeded out forevermore completely pure, completely holy. You don't have to worry about jealousy. You don't have to worry about envy. You don't have to worry about any type of corruption. And then number two, verse 43 says this, the righteous will also shine like the sun in this kingdom, the kingdom of their father. So you're gonna be blessed in this kingdom. You're gonna be shining in this kingdom. You're gonna be purified in this kingdom. You're gonna have an inheritance within this kingdom. You get to enjoy the beauty of being in this kingdom for all eternity long because you said yes to the justice of God being served on Jesus' shoulders in your replacement, past tense. Other phrases in scripture that depict the righteous enjoying the kingdom is the streets are gonna be apparently painted with gold. There's gonna be mansions in heaven. There will be mo no more weeping, no more sorrow, no more pain, no more hurts. There will be complete healing, a thousand percent healing in the kingdom of righteousness. You will forever be in the presence of God, the God of life, enjoying God. You enjoy him on the earth. You're gonna enjoy him for all eternity long. You know him on the earth. You're gonna know him for all eternity long because you're pursuing him. Have I mentioned the, the theme of our church is growing healthy lives as we pursue God? As we pursue God, equip you in God to reach the world for God because God wants more people in the category of the righteous. Number five, we also learn that the final judgment involves a final separation from the wicked. In other words, the wicked are gonna be separated from you. The wicked will permanently be separated from you. God's judgment involves a true separation. The wicked chose a lifetime to separate themselves from God over and over and over from God, and now their mind is made up. Therefore, God will not force them into heaven, and now God says, all right, you're gonna be completely separated from me. You see, even right now, the wicked right now, the wicked right now, think of the most corrupt person living on the earth, whoever that person is in your mind, they themselves right now still get to enjoy some of the presence of God, even though they don't even know him. 
just through the natural beauty of God's creation. They can enjoy the sunset just as much as you can. They can experience the rain. God makes it rain on the righteous and on the unrighteous. They can experience the beauty of just natural creation. God's all around this whole globe. This whole universe screens God. And so they can enjoy at a degree the presence of God right now. But the day will come when that judgment is final. It's done. The separation. You want to know what true hell is? It's complete separation from the God of life. It's complete separation from the God of life. So he separates the, the wicked from the righteous. He says, no more wickedness. We're, we're, we're getting the bad fish out. We're getting the weeds out of this kingdom. We're separating the goats from the sheep. Righteous, this judgment's not for you. Here you go. You're going to enjoy the beautiful kingdom. And wickedness, you're separated from my people, the righteousness. And now you're also separated from me. Here are some of the descriptions of being completely separated from the goodness, the beauty, the life, and the glory, the splendor of his majesty. And the sheep and the goats, Matthew 25 on the screen, depart from me. That's a separation from God. You who are cursed because of sin. Sin is cursed. Remember Jesus? He was the curse for us. You are cursed into the eternal fire, prepared for the devil and his angels. You see, God prepared the kingdom of righteousness for his righteous ones, but he prepared hell for the devil and his angels. He didn't prepare it for man. He prepared it for the devil and his angels, so it was never God's will, but man's will aligning to the devil's will. Then they will go away. They will be completely separated from all forms of life, to eternal punishment for their sin because the righteous, but the righteous to eternal life because of the righteousness accepted by Jesus. And then the parable of the dragnet puts it this way. In the next verse. The angels will come and separate the wicked from the righteous and they will throw them into the blazing furnace where there will be weeping. Weeping. Never again will there be laughter. Never again will there be a sense of enjoyment. No sense of life, but rather gnashing of teeth. Gnashing of teeth is total anguish. Just think of your hand touching a stove. <sighs> think of your hand being hammered with a, with a, with a, with a hammer and a, you miss the nail and hit your thumb. <sighs> okay, it's complete anguish, completely separated from God. Have you not understood all these things? Jesus asked them. Yes, the disciples said. Other places in scripture that depict in hell, 2 Thessalonians 1.9, they will be punished with everlasting destruction and shut out from the presence of the Lord and from the glory of his might. They will be completely shut out, completely separated, completely by themselves. Matthew chapter 8, Jesus says, they will be cast into outer darkness where there will be weeping, crying, gnashing of teeth, filled with sorrow for the punishment of sin. So the final judgment for the camp of the wicked is utter, separa uh, utter separation. There will be fire. There will be anguish. There will be sorrow. There will be weeping. There will be eternal punishment. It will be completely, completely dark. It's not a pretty picture. But Jesus says, the choice is yours. I give you free will. I'm a God of justice. I can't just allow evil to run rampant across the whole earth. I wouldn't be a just God. Number six, the final point. Finally, we, we learn that until the final judgment, until the final judgment, there will be a continual coexistence between the righteous and the wicked. The wheat and the weeds are going to coexist to one, with one another. The good fish and the bad fish are going to swim in the same lakes with one another. The sheep and the goats are going to enjoy the same creation with one another until the final judgment occurs. This coexistence gives the righteous a mission. This coexistence gives a righteous the mission. It gives the righteous time to model what it means to be childlike in their faith and to be children of light, praying for them and displaying the love of the Father. Matthew 5, says this. So if you're in the category of the righteous, you have an assignment, you have a mission. It's this. I tell you, love your enemies. 
And pray for those who persecute you, that you may be children of your Father in heaven. He causes his sun to rise on the evil and on the good, and he sends rain on the righteous and on the unrighteous. If you love those who love you, what reward will you get? Again, Jesus is in the category saying, I love you wicked people, and I love you righteous people. All of you guys are made in my image. This is my will for your life, that you receive my love, be transformed by my love. I take all the punishment of your sin because I'm displaying my love and righteousness on you. And so you as the righteous people, you have opportunity to display the love of God to the world. Number two, verse 46, it gives the righteous an opportunity to gain more rewards in heaven. Notice again verse 46, what reward will you get? So you want rewards if you're in the righteous camp and you want to face God's judgment, not the eternal judgment. I'm talking about just the accountability of getting rewards in heaven. Then love your enemies. Love people who are on the other side of the aisle. Love people who are do you wrong. Then you're going to reap up a ton of reward in heaven. It gives the righteous more time to evangelize the gospel. Acts 1.8, God says he wants us to be witnesses. Matthew 9, he says the harvest is really ripe. People want to come in the kingdom, but the laborers are few. Matthew 5, Jesus calls us the light of the world. He calls us the salt of this earth. 2 Corinthians 5 says we're to be ministers of reconciliation, imploring people to be reconciled back to God so they can become the righteousness of God. And then my last point is this. Why is this coexistence between the righteous and the wicked so long? Why is it so long? I mean, you might be here today, and you might be going, wow, this sounds pretty. This is an intense message. I get it. Come, this, this has been probably the most intense message I've ever preached here. But listen, why is the coexistence so long? Some of you guys are like, I can't wait till this wickedness is just done. I'm sick of corruption. I'm sick of just how dirty the world's becoming. I'm sick of what they're doing in the school system. I'm sick of what they're doing in the political system. I'm sick of the entertainment system. I'm sick of the whole music industry. I'm sick of how people are dressing these days and what's being advertised to the young kids these days. I'm sick of all this. When is this evil gonna end? Why does it have to coexist so long? And I believe it all boils down to this one point. It gives the wicked more time to repent and turn to the God of goodness as God doesn't want anyone to perish. He doesn't want anyone to perish. Look at the heart of God, and I'll close with this. On the screen, next slide, 1 Peter. The Lord is not slow in keeping his promise. Everybody say, he's not slow. He's not slow. As some understand slowness, instead he is patient, that means long-suffering, with you not wanting anyone to perish, but everyone to come to repentance. So is that God's heart? God did not prepare hell for humans. He prepared it for the devil and his angels and those who do the devil's will, who freely choose to do the devil's will. Ezekiel 33, 11 says this on the screen. I have no pleasure, no pleasure in the death of the wicked, but that the wicked turn from their evil ways and live. Isaiah 55, verse 7 says this on the screen. Let the wicked forsake his way and the unrighteous man his thoughts. Let him return to the Lord, and he will have mercy on him, for he will abundantly pardon. In other words, he will abundantly pardon all their sins. Again, God doesn't want anybody suffering in hell that's why he took the punishment upon himself but he's not going to force you to choose to love him for all eternity long if you choose to purposely not love him at all on planet earth and then expect just to walk into glory and finally because this final judgment and god sees this it's on the forefront of his mind he hears all the prayers going out on planet Earth. God, when are you going to come back and send your glory? When are you going to weed out of this earth all that those things are evil and all those things that are corrupt? This is why God rejoices so much so when one person repents. And I'll end with this, if the worship team can come up. Luke chapter 15 puts it this way. I tell you there is rejoicing in the presence of angels over one sinner who repents than over 99 people who don't need to repent. Now, a lot of people would say, Billy, there's a lot of rejoicing in heaven. The angels are rejoicing. No, 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 it does not say that. 
It does not say that. Although the angels are rejoicing, it doesn't say the angels are rejoicing. It says this, I tell you the truth, there is rejoicing in the presence of the angels over one sinner who repents. Well, who's in the presence of the angels? Who is the one worthy, seated on the throne, in the presence of all the angels? So who is the one that's rejoicing in the presence of all the angels? Jesus is the one who rejoices. There's a party in heaven, and Jesus is the one that's filled with the most joy because those who've been made in his image decided out of their free will to choose to say yes to the punishment of their sin being on God himself in exchange for them enjoying the mercy and the pleasures of knowing God forevermore. God's a God of love, but he's also a God of justice, and both of those were served when he died for you on the cross. Amen? Amen. Amen. Let's all stand.